Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome. While people are joining, if you'd like to type in chat where you're joining us from, um, and if you have a favorite parasite and you want to share that with us, feel free to type that in chat. I know uh, for myself, I don't know if I have a particular favorite parasite, but I did learn like two weekends ago that um, whale tapeworms can get to be like 120 feet long, which is fascinating and also kind of freaks me out a little bit, but it's really cool. Um, so yeah, if you have a favorite parasite, feel free to type that in chat. Um, but hello and welcome to Bugfest. This is our um, chat about our bee predators and parasite with parasites with Dr. Matt Bertone, and I'll introduce him in a second. But before I do that, I have a quick tutorial for those of you joining us from the Zoom side of things. Um, so with our Zoom, it's, your window should look kind of like this. Um, in the bottom left, you should see the option for muting and unmuting and turning on and off your video. Um, to protect your privacy during this program, we are not going to allow people to unmute or turn on their video. Um, but the thing that you can do is um, turn on captions. If you'd like to see captions from this program, you just click on this little closed captions button at the bottom here. And then you can click show subtitle to show those captions. And you can edit the subtitles to be larger or smaller if you'd like um, with that subtitles settings button down there as well. Um, if you would like to change, if you have your uh, Zoom view and gallery view and like to change so that you can see um, Matt or myself better, you can just click that speaker view button in the top right corner. And um, to see Matt's uh, presentation as well as his camera, you can click that side-by-side -side mode um, in that view options button up at the top there. Um, and you can adjust the size of the presentation um, with that slider bar that comes up on the side there. Um, you can see uh, the, the presentation a little bit larger if you'd like to. Um, and then finally, we've got that chat in the bottom there. Um, and we do ask, please feel free to type in your uh, questions, comments, and uh, observations. But we do ask that you are a good digital citizen, which means that if you would uh, respect both the presenter as well as your fellow attendees and uh, want to make sure that your chats and um, questions and comments and things like that stay on topic to what we're talking about. Um, and this presentation is going to be recorded to our Zoom or our uh, YouTube um, so that you can get this, um, check it out at the end if you wanted to watch it again um, through our YouTube channel there. All right, so with that, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Matt Bertone, who is the director of the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic at NC State. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Matt, and I will let you take it from here. Thanks, Sam. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I will share my screen. Okay. Well, thanks for joining in today. Um, uh, whoops. I'm trying to reduce this uh, videos. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, I am happy to talk about uh, an interesting subject to me, at least. Uh, I, I like bees, but they're pretty popular and pretty, uh, you know, QT and all that stuff. So I like to talk about all the predators and parasites of things. So I figured it might be a good time to discuss some of those things. I just realized I forgot a, a really interesting one, but maybe we'll touch on it at the end. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do today is talk about these things uh, that attack bees um, and uh, are the bane of bees. But uh, mostly I'm going to be focusing on things that you find in kind of North Carolina, Eastern North, North America, uh, rather than worldwide, because there's so many other things outside of the U.S. that, that attack bees. But I'm going to focus a little bit on these things. Um, and uh, so bees as hosts and prey. So bees are a diverse group of insects uh, that do have many predators, parasitoids, and parasites. Uh, parasitoids being uh, parasites that kill the host. Um, in the process. Uh, now, solitary bees have many that are not associated with honeybees, and then honeybees have several specialized enemies that have often now moved around the world with them as we move honeybees uh, with us to create the honey that we like to eat and the pollination services we like to use them for. 
Um, so I'm going to kind of you know, be specific on certain times when it's on a honeybee and when it's on uh, uh, other wild bees, uh, the more solitary bees. But uh, some of these actually uh, affect both groups. Now, why are bees such good hosts and prey? Well, one of the things is they live in nests with pollen, nectar, honey, and other materials, wax, and things like that in the case of honeybees. They offer many resources for other organisms. Uh, including the bees and their larvae also. So there's lots of nutritious material inside these nests for um, things to attack uh, and feed on. Um, and bees are nutritious themselves. Uh, now, although bees can sting, mo most bees can sting, uh, that doesn't always protect them against all these predators as well. So first, I'm going to talk about a few uh, basically generalist predators. So generalist predators are those that will hunt, kill, and eat anything. Uh, some are a little bit more specific. Uh, so many animals feed regularly or opportunistically on bees. Some are actually immune to their venom. Um, so I'm gonna get the vertebrates out of the way because I'm gonna focus on mostly arthropods after this because that's my specialty. But of course, birds, uh, these little dinosaurs are uh, one of the main predators of bees they can be. Um, you can see these birds uh, with the, you know, caught the bees, kill them, and uh, feed on them. Uh, and this one actually has some drone, some male honeybees, um, which cannot sting, luckily, for the bird. Um, there's also a lot of mammals that will eat bees. Uh, so bears are known to break into beehives and nests uh, and, uh, and other wasps to, to uh, feed on the uh, honey, but also the larvae. Uh, found in there, and sometimes the actual bees themselves. Uh, skunks are also uh, notorious for breaking into beehives and uh, bee nests to uh, feed on the larvae, the, the stores, the stored products, and uh, sometimes the adults and whatnot. So uh, these will do that. Uh, I didn't mention also lizards will often also eat bees, although they're probably, some of the smaller ones are probably a little bit more uh, susceptible to bee stings. So um, they, uh, they may not be hunting them as much, and they actually have to catch hold of them. But that's as far as the vertebrates go. I'm not going to talk much about them. There are uh, other things across the world, like bee-eater birds, which are really beautiful-looking uh, birds in uh, Africa and other areas of the world uh, that do often specialize in bees. Uh, and uh, my colleague actually just mentioned you know, honey guides and the honey badgers that like to uh, eat uh, honeybee nests or, or lead people to honeybee nests. So uh, there are things around the world that, uh, that feed on honeybees and other bees as well. But uh, as far as other generalist predators, uh, one of the most common groups is spiders, of course. They feed on just about anything they can capture. Um, and most of the ones that feed on bees are going to be either web builders like orb weavers uh, and others that trap the bees uh, while they're in flight uh, in, their, in their webs. Uh, that makes it a little bit easier to immobilize them. Uh, and they, shoot, uh, they, they basically kick some silk onto these bees to immobilize them where they can bite them with the venom and, and uh, keep them from stinging. Uh, and then they feed on the nice juicy parts. Uh, but also a lot of uh, spiders, especially crab spiders, that sit at flowers, on flowers. This is a perfect site for uh, them to capture bees because bees visit flowers uh, for pollen and nectar. So um, so you will see bees, you, you know, if you often walk by a flower and you see a bee kind of just hanging out there like upside down or looking like it's uh, sleeping, it may not be sleeping. It may be fed upon by this crab spider that may look and be camouflaged in the flower and may be difficult to see. So, um, so those spiders are a major predator of bees, um, especially the web building and the flower sitting ones. Uh, there are lots of bugs, predatory bugs, especially some of the larger assassin bugs that will eat bees. Uh, so wheel bugs are our largest assassin bug and you can see how big it is compared to a honeybee. Uh, it has no problem uh, attacking and killing a honeybee with their own venom. Uh, and again, these will often wait on flowers for uh, insects to come by, uh, but they will catch anything that comes by. So bees just happen to be part of that diet. Uh, there is an assassin bug in the genus Apiomerus. Uh, there's these assassin bugs are typically called bee assassin bugs. Uh, they do often capture bees, although they're not specifically feeding on them. Um, it's, they like to hang out on the tips of vegetation, so they happen to catch them. 
Um, and again, they also have a venom that when they jab the bee, they inject it into the bee. Uh, and you'll notice in this one, there's all these opportunistic flies feeding on the dead bee and the juices uh, after it's been killed by the assassin bug. Uh, large aerial predators like dragonflies will, of course, eat bees. Um, and uh, I didn't put in here, but uh, many of the large wasps uh, like hornets and yellow jackets will also hunt bees right out of the air um, and chop them up and they will feed them to their young, but the dragonflies are aerial predators that will uh, basically capture the bees and chew them up and uh, ingest them. And there are also a lot of flies that hunt uh, bees. So robber flies are these large predatory flies that uh, will capture bees uh, and they actually will jab them with a um, really sharp proboscis that, uh, that they then inject venom into the bee to immobilize it and then suck it dry. They don't have chewing mouth parts, they need to suck the liquids out. Uh, so some of them grab them by their legs uh, and hold them like that with these spiny legs. And once they're immobilized, they will sit and feed on them. Uh, here a large, uh, this robber fly is about an inch long or so. Uh, and it has a very small native bee. They, even the large ones will sometimes just capture and impale these small, uh, in smaller insects. And this one happens to have a bee. And not only do they feed on bees uh, many times, although again, the generalist predators are gonna feed on a lot of different uh, insects, but many of them also look like bees. Uh, now, this could be a way to protect them. Uh, they do have a painful bite and they could jab if, if something something grabs them. So it, it would be as if a bee was stinging them. Um, so it's probably for protection, but there's also the possibility of aggressive mimicry. And aggressive mimicry is when uh, insects or other animals mimic their hosts or the, the things that they feed on so they can gain access to them. So I'm not sure exactly how much that contributes to this. They will certainly eat bees, and this is the size of a large bumblebee. So it's a, it's a fairly large fly, predatory fly. Okay, now for the fun stuff. So we're kind of out of the generalist predators. We're getting into more specific groups uh, that like to, to do bad things to bees. Uh, so first question, what is this? Anybody want to take a guess as to what this is? And I don't know if somebody wants to let me know what people are guessing. I yeah, think. I'm going to wait a few seconds. We've got a couple of guesses in chat of flies. Okay, fly. That is okay. a fly. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll switch to the next slide. It might, you know. But the wings are strange. That's what they say. They say the wings yeah. are strange. Okay, what about this? So this is another angle. Good observations. So this is an interesting one. Beetle question mark. <laughs> okay. A beetle question mark. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else? Anybody? Uh... Um, maybe a moth, someone says. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Says it so looks this... similar to cicada wings as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. This is a totally weird critter. Um, but uh, somebody hesitantly, though, got it correct. It is a beetle, actually. So let's talk about a few beetles that attack uh, bees. So um, this is really one of my favorite groups. Uh, when I saw this one uh, on these flowers, I was super excited because it's not a really common group of beetles that you see, uh, but the wedge-shaped beetles, these are in the family Ripoporidae. So many of the beetles in the family do look more beetle-like. They have these longer wing cases, wing coverings called elytra, although they have this uh, these longer wing, membranous wings. They have really funky antennae and this kind of blunt tip of the abdomen. Uh, they often visit flowers, but uh, this one is a different genus than this one, and it has these very short wing coverings and these really long membranous wings, which does make it confusing as to what it is at first. Um, but you can see it's sitting there on that flower. This one is probably drinking nectar, but uh, this one is, uh, is doing another activity. And so what it is doing is it's laying eggs in the flowers. And what happens is uh, once those eggs, once the flowers start to develop and they become attractive to insects, the larvae uh, emerge from the eggs. The larvae are this weird mobile form called a triungulant. Uh, and they actually have long legs and they kind of go out on the flowers. And when the bees, specifically sweat bees, come and feed on these flowers, this is goldenrod, which is often visited by bees, uh, they actually hop onto the bee. Here's one on the wing of a bee. 
uh, and they will coat the bee basically. And when the bee goes back to its nest in the ground, uh, it'll hop off that and it'll climb onto the um, pollen ball and basically attach to a larva once it's uh, hatched, once the bee's larva is hatched. Uh, it'll overwinter with it. And then in the spring, when the larva becomes more active, it will enter the larva. It'll then turn into this grub-like uh, larva. And this is actually called hypermetamorphosis, where you have these vastly different forms. It's a very mobile form that finds the host, and then this grub-like feeding form. And what these will do is they'll feed inside the bee uh, larva for a little while while it's still alive. And then they pop out and they curl around it and they actually plug the hole they popped out of and then curl around the, the host and basically feed on it until it's dry and dead. Uh, and then it develops and to this beetle that then leaves the nest and goes to start its life cycle again. So pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but it's not alone in doing this. So actually uh, a family that's thought to be closely related and can be familiar to people are the blister beetles. So blister beetles are famous beetles because they produce a chemical called cantharidin. It causes uh, blistering on human skin. And while the adults are may, will often feed on uh, plants, it can be pests of alfalfa and other types of crops, the larvae are very similar to the wedge-shaped beetles. They have a triangulan stage, this really mobile stage that um, is often found on flowers, but they actually uh, will lay the eggs in the soil. And these larvae are very fast and run around either looking for bee nests or they'll climb up on flowers. And when the bees uh, visit the flowers, they these little lizard-like larvae uh, climb on top of them and then complete a similar life cycle as the wedge-shaped beetles, where they go back to the nest, they hop off, they eat all the pollen and the larvae of the bees, and then they, they use those stores to develop. And you'll see this kind of common, a common theme across a lot of these insects. Okay, now onto a specific uh, beetle that's specific to uh, honeybees. Uh, this is a really destructive pest or can be a destructive pest called the small hive beetle, Athena tumida. It's a type of sap beetle in the family Nidodulidae, which are a very common group of beetles, but this one, uh, originated in South, Southern Africa uh, and is first found in the U.S. in 1996. Um, they largely affect weakened hives, uh, so the adults in healthy hives will not be able to um, reproduce very well, but once they find a weakened hive, uh, the larvae, they lay eggs in the cells, the larvae feed on the honey, the pollen stores, and the developing brood, and this is what the larvae look like. They're a, uh, a beetle larva, so they have these legs in the front and kind of a long long body. They're distinguished by these uh, spikes all over the body. Um, the adults are really adorable, I think, but uh, they're really quick and really pestiferous, obviously, to honeybees and beekeepers. Um, with this, when the larvae um, dig around and tunnel around in the hives, they actually, the honey will uh, leak out. They'll foul the combs with their feces, things like that, and they cause the bees to uh, abandon the hive. So this has been one of the major pests, uh, insect pests of uh, honeybees in the US now. Um, and you can see here's a bunch of adult beetles. They're not tiny. They are, you know, a decent sized beetle as compared to the bee crawling around the hive. And here are a bunch of their larvae fouling the combs. So they just bore in and they cause all this destruction basically. So these beetles do are specific to honeybees only but, and we unfortunately have them in the U.S. now, and they can be common across North Carolina and much of, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming coast to coast here. So, yeah, so that's uh, that's beetles. Um, so now we're going to shift gears and we're going to go over to the true flies, one of my favorite groups. Beetles are also one of my favorite groups, but these are the diptera, the true flies. Uh, these uh, flies have only two wings and uh, usually have... Uh, um, lapping mouth parts, and many people know flies, but uh, maybe some people don't know these flies. So the first group are going to be the bee flies. And even though they're called bee flies, it's more because they look like bees. Many of the species look like bees, but some species are associated, highly associated with bees. So many have really complicated biologies. They parasitize all different things. You can see the table down here. It's mostly bees and wasps, but Moths and sawflies, locusts and grasshoppers, flies, grubs, 
things like that can be parasitized by bee flies. It's a really diverse group. Um, the, many of them shoot their eggs into the nests of solitary bees. Um, and some of them actually coat the eggs in sand gathered in the tip of the female abdomen. They actually have what's called a sand chamber. So they will they will lay the egg in this chamber and then kind of grab some sand and coat the, them in there um, in that in, in that, uh, that substrate. Uh, some can produce thousands of eggs per day. And the one I'm gonna focus on can, and that's gonna be the tiger bee fly. So uh, this one uh, is a common bee fly around here. I'd say it's probably the most common one I see. A fairly large insect, the bite length is uh, close to an inch long, really beautiful wing patterns. They often are seen hovering around buildings and human structures. People do freak out a little bit about them because they think it might be an actual wasp or bee that can sting them, but they're completely harmless, um, except for if you are a carpenter bee uh, larva. And uh, so uh, I was fortunate enough, uh, one of the speakers, I think tomorrow, Elsie Youngstead, who is going to be talking to you about carpenter bees, uh, they found um, this larva on one of the bee larvae. So these big larvae are the carpenter bee larvae. Uh, then you've got this little tiny larva sitting on it and puncturing it and drinking blood and stuff. And that's the tiger bee larva. And while it is small at this stage, it does tend to grow, of course. And so then it starts to get bigger and it's almost as big as the actual carpenter bee larva. And then at some point it basically says, I'm done eating and it sucks the entire larva dry. And that's the old carpenter bee larva there. Um, and this very fat uh, bee fly larva. After uh, it's completed its larval stage, of course, uh, these things pupate and the tiger bee Tiger bee fly pupa is this kind of gnarly looking thing with all these kind of crazy uh, spines and, and whatnot all over it. Uh, but these help it actually get out of the uh, tunnel of carpenter bees in the wood. And what they do is they, they do this motion where they um, kind of uh, uh, twitch their body, stretch it and stuff, and, and they wiggle their way out. And uh, this is uh, one of the scenes I saw when I went, came home uh, several years ago, uh, outside of, uh, of my house and my porch, there was a carpenter bee nest here, and all these are shed pupil skins, and here's this nice tiger bee fly that has emerged now. So again, these these actually, if you don't like carpenter bees, these are really welcome parasites, of course, because they can help reduce the populations, although they're not going to completely control the carpenter bees. So one of my favorite bee, local bee flies, and there are other bee flies that attack other bees, like ground nesting bees and whatnot. But this was this was an interesting common one. And we had a question about like the the size reference of the adult tiger bee fly. Is so is it about the same size as a carpenter bee? Almost, yeah. Okay. You can see it here next to the hole. Yeah. You know, so the carpenter bee holes most people have seen they're about uh, three eighths of an inch uh, in diameter. So it's a decent, it's a decent sized fly. It's one of our larger flies actually around here. So wow, yeah, great. and it's got a lot of food with those carpenter bee larvae. So, yeah. Okay, another one of my favorites are the thick-headed flies, the canopidae. Uh, so actually, in Britain, they call them bee grabbers uh, or wasp grabbers because the females grab bees and wasps midair and pry their abdomen open, the segments of the abdomen open with this can opener like. A uh, structure called a theca, uh, and then they lay an egg inside. Uh, then the larva, this uh, maggot, will develop inside each host, and uh, they will attack all different bees. They, they, some of them prefer bumblebees, and what will happen actually is that the bumblebee will kind of uh, leave the hive and kind of dig underground once the uh, maggot is about done feeding, uh, and that's probably to protect the maggot, but really weird looking flies and often actually wasp mimics themselves. So these are decent sized flies uh, from, from I would say a third of an inch to about half an inch or three quarters of an inch, some of them. So these are uh, myopa, they attack um, uh, different bees as well. And this uh, this is a physocephala, which is shown here, the, the can opener on it. So really interesting, often found in flowers too. Um, we'll take nectar and whatnot but bee mimics, but also bee killers. Uh, satellite flies are a really interesting group uh, of flesh flies. Uh, normally the groups of, in this uh, family are carrion feeders. They feed on dead meat and dead animals and stuff. 
but this group actually patrol wasps and bee nests. Uh, and when the bees and wasps are gone, they sneak in there and they lay their maggots in the nests. And again, eat the food stores, eat the, the brood of the bees and wasps. So these are, uh, I should mention here, all the, a lot of these things that do this are called kleptoparasites. Basically, they don't do their own kind of provisioning or whatnot. They basically steal the provisions and the resources from uh, other insects. So you're going to see a lot of these throughout this talk. Now, one of my favorite flies that doesn't even look like a fly is a bee louse. So bee lice are in the family Browlidae. Uh, they are tiny wingless eyeless flies that don't really resemble flies, in fact. Uh, these are not the eyes. These are the antennae. Um, so these are really tiny, like I said, only about a millimeter or so long. Uh, they live inside beehives, so they're only associated with honeybees, although different wild bees across the honeybees across the world have different uh, bee lice. Uh, there's a few species around, um, but they live inside the beehives, crawl on the honeybees, and especially on the queens. Now, these aren't so terrible uh, in some ways because they don't actually kind of kill the bee or pierce it or do whatever. What they do is they actually crawl to the, the head and the face of the bee and stimulate it to make it um, uh, regurgitate food. And then it eats that and then crawls back on the bee and kind of just hangs out. So they're not a super big pest of the actual bees. Um, they're not super common either around here, although I'd love to find one myself. Uh, and the larvae are maggots that tunnel in the cells with the honey. So they basically will tunnel in one single cell or so and feed on some of the, the com contents of those. So they're not typically a huge pest of honeybees, but what's really cool is that they have these really weird claws. Uh, so instead of the two claws that you normally see in, in many, uh, insects, they have this comb of claw, like their claws are these combs. And of course, that's to help them hang on to the fur of bees. And so here's one, here's a honeybee, and you can see how big this uh, bee louse is. And again, this is a fly. This is a totally weird little fly. So one of my favorites. Yeah, and we uh, have a clarifying question. Um, yes. Ashley was wondering, what was the name of the last one with the can opener body? So that's a thick-headed fly in the thick family Canopidae. So yeah, so um, that's that's what to search for. Uh, there are some Canopids that uh, parasitize other things, but it's uh, they are actually thought to be maybe a different group. But most of the Canopids around are going to be parasitizing uh, bees. Okay, so nice. and and some other wasps. Yeah. Great, thank you. And you'll see that actually is a common theme too. That bees are really just specialized wasps, and so a lot of these things will attack both bees and wasps. Yeah, and we have a question about the bee lice in the chat. Sure. How do they get in and around the bees without like other bees noticing? Do they ever got, get caught red-handed? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think what they do is they kind of hide when they're not feeding, uh, kind of in the, in the back of the thorax and kind of areas that are a little less uh, seen. And they basically just start to kind of smell like the hive and all that stuff. So they're probably not found out very often. They just kind of... Um, there is, there is in some of these groups of parasites, there are, um, there are known resistances among bees where ones that groom more, uh, can get rid of some of these parasites and others that don't groom as much have higher loads of these parasites. Um, but I'm not sure exactly, uh, how they, they do it specifically, but apparently the bees don't notice them too much and, uh, and they, uh, and they're not, a, there's only a couple usually on each bee. Uh, so uh, unless it's a queen, that sometimes they get a lot of them on there so they can disperse out uh, and uh, get to other colonies, uh, make other colonies. So, yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay, now a couple moths. You might not think moths and butterflies would be, uh, Lepidopter would be uh, kind of attacking bees or, or, or pests of bees, but there are actually a couple, and one is a really major pest. So the greater wax moth, uh, Galleria melanella. This is actually uh, uh, an insect you can buy in pet stores to feed um, feed uh, your pets, like uh, lizards and whatnot. These are the, these are called wax worms or wax moths. Um, and it's the larva. It's a caterpillar, the larva of a moth. But they are pests of honeybees specifically, honeybee hives, cracks and crevices of the hives, and the larvae then um, hatch, feed on the pollen, the honey, uh, the brood, even. And when they get too dense, they can actually be cannibalistic. They'll eat each other. 
So uh, really kind of voracious feeders in the, in the hive. They can cause honey leaking. Uh, so they tunnel through the hive and they're fairly large. They're, they're almost an inch long. These caterpillars are three quarters of an inch long, decent sized caterpillars. Um, and they cause honey leaking through their damage. And the, sink, the silk that they produce actually in, can entangle emerging bees who die of starvation. This is actually called galleriasis. And uh, just to see how gross and nasty they are, this is a severe infestation in a hive. You can see all that silk, all that fecal matter. These are the cocoons of them. Uh, basically, these caterpillars have gone through and ravaged this honeycomb. Now, there's another uh, non-native um, species of moth. And there are a few moths, actually, even stored pantry pests that will affect uh, bee nests and hives, especially with there's a lot of detritus. And they feed on this kind of general detritus. Uh, but one that's a little bit more specific is the bumblebee wax moth, uh, Aphomia sociella. So it's native to Europe. And it lives in various wasp nests, but also bumblebee nests. And it actually has even been found in rodent nests and uh, bird nests. Um, again, feeding on kind of the, the, um, the debris and kind of the structural material in there. Uh, they feed the nest material, the stored foods, waste, and immature stages sometimes of these bees. Um, and we get in photos every once in a while, or, or colleagues do, where somebody lifts up uh, something in an attic or somewhere, and they see all these long white uh, cocoons, and that's characteristic of these, these, uh, these moths. The larvae uh, are, like I said, found in all types of wasp nests. So they can even be paper wasp nests and hornet wasps net, hornet nests. So, um, so you'll find them sometimes associated with human structures as well. So those are some moths that actually attack bees or at least uh, attack their nests and, and sometimes kill the, the bees, uh, the larvae and stuff like that in the process and can make things really gross for those bees to live in. Okay, a couple of mites. Uh, so mites are arachnids. Uh, they are, um, they're not insects, uh, but there are lots and lots of mites that uh, are associated with bees, either in kind of a, a loose association or a very tightly parasitic and, and, and whatnot situation. Now there's a really great website called Bee Mite ID that goes over all, a lot of these mites. Um, a colleague, uh, uh, Pavel Klimov, uh, he, uh, he developed this site with a number of other acrologists and is a really great website. I would definitely suggest going and seeing all these weird mites that are associated with different bees. And he has some quick guides to certain groups of bees. So all the ones that are associated with bumblebees, all the ones that are associated with uh, mining bees, things like that. Now, some, like the ones shown here, are actually predatory uh, mites that travel on bees to get to different nests, where they then in the nest they'll feed on other organisms that are associated with the bee nests, sometimes even killing uh, the pests. But um, And some of them actually just are phoretic on them. They actually just glue themselves to the bees to move around, uh, and then they develop in the nests or other places. This is also why in bee hotels for native bees, you want to clean them out every year because they can, you can get infestations of mites that stay in the holes, in the tubes, uh, that can infest the bees the next year. So it's good good idea to make sure they're fresh uh, housing in all those bee hotels in the springs. But the two main ones I'm going to talk about are um, really specific. Uh, basically, both these are specific to honeybees and can be very destructive. So the first are the bee tracheal mites, Acarapus woodi. So uh, there are actually a couple of species of Acarapus out there. Uh, and these are tiny, tiny mites in this family called Tarsonemidae. Now, the group is really interesting, especially to me, because it's a really diverse group. Many of them feed on fungi. Some of them are actually really uh, important plant pests, but a lot of them are also associated with insects, and the bee trachea mite is one of them. So these mites are so tiny, they can live in the little breathing tubes that are basically uh, in the thorax of a bee. So the very large branch of the trachea, which are these breathing tubes uh, in the thorax of a bee are big enough to house these mites. And they basically live inside there their entire life. They breed inside there um, and they suck blood, suck the bee's blood through that lining of the, of the tubes. And uh, this is what a female and a male look like. Uh, they've got all these weird hairs all over them, these big claws and stuff. 
Um, again, very tiny uh, mites. Um, now they can, because uh, because they pierce the, the inside of the trachea, they can cause secondary infections. So that allows infections to get inside the bee's blood um, by puncturing the trachea. Uh, also, when they uh, increase in population, they can almost clog those breathing tubes uh, in the bees. And so this can actually make them more bees more lethargic. Uh, they don't work as hard. They don't um, in the uh, winters or when they're trying to warm up or cool down the, the, the nests, they can't uh, produce as much uh, energy to uh, flap their wings, the bees. So these the tracheal mites can actually be important pests and can, can be serious pests of bees. And again, these are, these are specific to honeybees. Now, another one you may have heard of is a completely different group of mites. In fact, these mites are more closely related to ticks and actually very closely related to bird mites. So these parasites, these blood feeding parasites of birds and rodents, uh, but the Varroa mite of a Varroa destructor is the most destructive pest of honeybees in the world. Uh, this mite uh, is, I think they're kind of cute and really interesting looking. They look like this saucer, flying saucer with these legs coming out of it. Uh, very cute, but you definitely don't want them if you're a bee. Um, they just discovered actually some uh, uh, at NC State, one of, uh, at least one person at NC State uh, helped discover that they once thought that these pierced the bees and sucked their hemolymph, like the tracheal mites, the blood, but they now know that they feed on the fat bodies. Uh, these, these mites will infest the abdomen of the bees, get in between the, they wedge themselves in between the segments, and then they uh, tap into the fat bodies of the bees. And they'll feed on larvae, pupae, and adults of the bees. They have a really complex life cycle. Um, but because, and they prefer drone bees uh, for some reason, maybe because they have more fat, but uh, because they feed on a fat body, a fat body in, uh, in insects is actually an organ, basically. And, it, and it's really associated with a lot of different things, including immunity, um, uh, protein production, things like that. And so when they affect the fat bodies, the, the thinking is now that the that weakens the bees and makes them more susceptible to viruses. Uh, and it can also, they can directly kill or deform the hosts when they're parasitizing the pupae. Um, so these can be obviously a really major issue uh, to honeybees uh, when they're present in the beehives. And here you go, these are some really fantastic images from Gil St. Martin uh, of one of them on a bee pupa and one of them on the head of a pupa. And you can see that's actually the, you've got the legs right here. These are the palps and they've got these saw-like mouth parts that they use to anchor into the bees and feed on those fat bodies. So again, really destructive mite, um, you know, common in, uh, in North Carolina. Hopefully not too common if you've got beehives because they, they can be really destructive. Okay, finally, uh, other wasps. So bees are a type of wasp, uh, but there are lots of other wasps that like to feed on bees or, or do, do certain things to bees. Uh, so first, anybody know what this is? Wait for the answers to come in. Oh, people are saying a bee. A bee. A bee? Someone, okay. Someone says a great golden wasp. Yeah, it's actually pretty small. So this is the usual <laughs> grass blade. So yeah. Yep. Yeah. You would think it's a bee, and uh, you'd be right. It is a bee. So this is a sweat bee. A uh, cute little sweat bee. You can see the pollen actually on its hind legs. And uh, I was uh, hanging out on the up up a river bank, kind of. Uh, taking photos, and there were all these little sweat bees and other types of mini bees around, and they like these habitats uh, because they can dig in the ground there. And so a lot of bees, most of the bees around here are solitary ground nesting bees, uh, and they just kind of dig their nests. They create little cells in there. They make their pollen balls with some nectar, and they lay eggs on it, an egg on it, and the larvae then emerge and feed on those pollen balls. And so they're they're very happy there. But I also then, while I was uh, among these bees, noticed something else crawling around. So here's one of the bee nests. You can see the, the bits of debris that have come out from the bee nests. Uh, and this thing is using its antennae, which in insects are like their nose, 
uh, to kind of sniff this debris. So really tiny little critter, uh, really pretty. And here's another angle. So anybody know what this is? We already have a guess in, in chat of a velvet ant, which is a type okay. of Okay. Any other guesses? Um, other people are saying wasp. Mm -hmm. Other people are saying ants. Okay. <laughs> I think yeah. it's about 50 50, either ant yeah. or wasp. <laughs> Well, actually, I didn't include ants on this, although ants will eat bees. Of course, some they will uh, attack bees that are kind of uh, on the ground or easily accessed, and they can kill them. But this is correct. That is correct. This is a velvet ant. So velvet ants are a group of wasps. They are they uh, look like ants, but they are actually distantly related. Um, and they are a group of wasps where the females, like this one, are wingless, and the males, for instance, the male of this species. Uh, is black and has wings, looks like a, just a typical wasp. Um, but they are wingless wasps and are heavily armored and have a really gigantic sting, uh, stinger, uh, much longer than their, the rest, uh, relative to their body than other wasps. Uh, and actually somebody that gave the talk, the person who gave the talk on bees yesterday mentioned that as well, because they work on mutilids, these velvet ants. Really interesting group of wasps. These, uh, they do parasitize all different things, but um, they actually, many of them do parasitize uh, ground nesting bees. And this one in particular, this, this species, uh, looks for those swept bee nests and they basically crawl inside. Again, they're heavily armored. It's actually very difficult to push a pin through many of these because they're so thick. And that's because uh, their prey it can sting them. And so they, they crawl into those nests they will lay an egg on uh, the larvae and pupae of the bees, and uh, their, their young will feed on those bees as well. Um, they're called velvet ants because many of them are hairy. Uh, and the, one of the ones that people know most of it is the cow killer. It's a very large velvet ant. So that, that typically um, goes into the nests of ground nesting wasps, the hunting wasps, like cicada killers. But this one prefers uh, small sweat bees, and it's actually like about the size of a small sweat bee. And this is actually a really common lifestyle for, for other wasps. So not only are velvet ants uh, one of these things that will go into nests and do that, but uh, cuckoo wasps, the, many of them will, uh, uh, will enter the nests of other wasps, but there are some species like uh, species of crisis that actually uh, invade bee nests and will do that to bees. And these two are very heavily armored. Uh, they have actually the tip of the abdomen is especially thick and they'll actually hold it in front of their face when they're entering nests of uh, stinging wasps. Um, these are really beautiful wasps. They sometimes call them jewel wasps. I, I love them. Uh, but you'll see them flying around and investigating all types of wasp nests, including bees. And if that isn't enough, it's not just wasps, but there are also lots of cuckoo bees. So bees themselves, there are a lot of bees that are not happy to go collect their own pollen. And you'll see that they have these very regular legs that don't actually collect pollen. They don't have any specialized structures. Uh, they are also heavily uh, sclerotized, meaning they're very thick bodied with these very hard shells because these all uh, don't collect pollen. They don't do any work for themselves, for their babies, except for the work of getting into the nests of other bees um, uh, to lay their eggs in their nests and then uh, their larvae feed on all the pollen and nectar that the other bees have worked so hard to collect. So that's why they call them cuckoo bees. These cuckoo wasps and cuckoo bees, just like the cuckoo bird, uh, lays its eggs in the nests of other birds. These uh, bees lay their eggs in the nests of other bees. Um, and one of the most common groups, the two more, more common ones around here are nomada, which look both these, all these look like wasps. Nomada especially look like just a wasp, not a bee. Um, and then Celioxys is a, uh, is a leaf, my, uh, leaf cutting bee uh, that has become a kleptoparasite as well. Okay, so finally, um, there's a really interesting group of hunting wasps called the bee wolves in the genus Philanthus. Now these are related to uh, mud daubers and cicada killers and whatnot, but they're a bit smaller, um, but they capture and sting adult bees. And this is uh, in this in North America. These are usually sweat bees, the helictidae. So those poor helictid sweat bees get uh, velvet ants and all these other things trying to get them. Of course, they were one of the more common uh, groups of uh, bees around. 
Um, and these wasps actually collect several uh, bees and put them in a chamber and lay an egg on the pile, which will then become the food for the larvae. Um, I also heard that they sting them in the brain, basically, to immobilize them. So imagine just kind of going about your business and something grabs you and stings you in the brain and then puts you alive into an underground cell with their larvae. So pretty horrific. Um, really interesting thing is this group of uh, wasps, the females actually culture bacteria in their antennae to line the cells uh, against microbes. So they actually, um, it's a really strange phenomenon where the, in between the segments, they grow these bacteria that they can then exude into the cells that help uh, keep everything fresh and, uh, and un uninfected in the, in the cell. Now in Europe, there's a, there's a species, a couple species that hunt honeybees. And so you can see this. And I just wanted to finish up the talk by trying to quickly, if I can go show this video, uh, this uh, Steve Everett, uh, who's known as uh, one whisper, Whistling Joe, uh, he does these amazing videos. Uh, he posts them on Twitter of, uh, of these wasps. And so I'm going to try to, let's see. So I'm going to try to share now this. So here is a, uh, everybody can see it. Here is a, he does these amazing videos where he leaves the camera next to nests and you can see this, uh, this bee wolf with a bee that's paralyzed. It uh, holds it with its middle legs and then does the work with the rest of its legs and basically digs into the sand uh, to bury this bee. Um, I don't know whether the bee is kind of sleeping or, or knows what's happening. I hope it's sleeping, but uh, it's uh, paralyzed, definitely, and it's going to be the host for this uh, wasp. And uh, you can see some of uh, Steve Everett's other uh, um, videos. I can send a link uh, in afterward. Um, but really interesting videos of different uh, hunting wasps. But these bee wolves are really cool. It's so quick at digging. It's so yeah, quick. It's yeah. These hunting wasps are really good at digging. They often have the front legs have these combs. These uh, uh, the, they're used to, to dig really well in sand, in loose soils and stuff. So, yeah. So, um, I guess I'm going to stop this video. Well, I don't know if we want to wait until it's done. We probably have, I want to leave some time for questions, but yeah. Yeah, and, that makes sense. Okay. We've and got a lot of really good questions. Yeah. And so, let me actually stop this one. And actually, one of the things I did forget to share, this is the one thing I did forget to share, was sure. I forgot to talk about Strepsiptera, which are a really weird order of insects um, that uh, the, uh, the young invade. Basically, they, they hang out on flowers. They also have a triangulant-type larva uh, that's mobile, like those uh, blister beetles and whatnot. And they actually um, infest, infect the abdomens of wasps and bees. And uh, the females then develop and stay their entire life inside of the insect. The males come out and are this strange fly-like insect. And uh, they go and mate with females and other wasps that then produce young right out of their genital opening and mouth and kind of get destroyed in the process. So these really weird parasites. Here's, a, here's one and the female and the male look very different. Uh, don't know why I blanked on that and including that, but they're a really cool group as well. So I'm going to stop sharing and go back to this. And uh, and have any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. All. Thank you so much. Those are fascinating <laughs> to learn about the parasites and the, the predators. Um, we had a couple of questions. Um, as far as like when these the the predators and the parasites they they enter the hive and things like that, do bees have like defenses? Do they sting them? Are they able to sting them? I know they've got the like the the exoskeleton, so are they able to get the the stinger through? Because you were talking about with like velvet ants, they have that really thick exoskeleton to protect them from that. Yeah, so some of them are just sneaky, and they get past the the guards and and whatnot. I was actually reading. A uh, really, really detailed description of when that velvet ant, that species of velvet ant, attacks a social colony. They're social sweat bees as well, and so they're guards to the nest. And what they'll do is they'll try and get in, and if they 
they get some resistance, they'll kind of try to move on to a less res, uh, resistant colony, but they can sneak past them. And because they are so uh, hardened and whatnot, they have, uh, they're really tightly built. They just, uh, you know, the you can't even get a pin through them. So getting a bee stinger through them is, is really difficult. Um, yeah. Other things just kind of smell like the bees or um, basically uh, get in in times or lay their eggs there where the larvae are small and are unnoticed until they get really big. So they have all these different strategies to try and avoid getting getting killed by the bees. Great, thank you. Um, and you did, you actually kind of mentioned something from another question that we had. Um, uh, Elise was wondering that wild bees seem to be characterized often as solitary. Are there any social wild bees? So you mentioned that some sweat bees are social. Are there any other species that... Yeah, yeah, there are a lot. So the honeybee is, of course, non-native, and it's a it's a eusocial um, bee. But there are, of course, bumblebees are social. Uh, so that's one of the most more famous groups of native bees that are social. Um, although they typically have small colonies. But yeah, some of these sweat bees. Uh, not, I don't know about this genus here, but some of them actually, even within the same genus, you'll have species that are social and species that are solitary. And even sometimes, uh, even during certain environmental conditions or certain times of year, they'll be more social or less social. And then some do have a queen and workers and things like that. So we do have some uh, some social, uh, eusocial uh, bees natively, but the, the majority of the ones uh, in the U.S. are going to be solitary bees or maybe nesting communally, but not, not really uh, forming kind of casts and, and taking care of each other's young and things like that. All right. Um, Ashley was wondering, is there anything that we can do that would help the bees from beetles but not hurt the beetles? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, you mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's the small hive beetle? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So small hive beetle, there there are, um, you know, beekeepers have some tools. Um, there are, uh, I read, for instance, that they, you know, the, the beetles, they will leave, once the larvae are done, they'll drop to the ground and burrow in the ground and then pupate there. So sometimes uh, there are, you know, controls for the beetles that go into the ground that don't kill the bees. But really, you know, there's there's not much you can do if you want to keep both happy. I mean, the beetles are very happy to get the, you know, to enter the beehives and, and do their thing. And the bees are would be happier without them. But it, it's tough. It's really, it would be tough, I think, to preserve both species uh, equally as well. Um, so, yeah. But I think, I think with the uh, small hive beetles, keeping the hives healthy, the bees happy and healthy, can really uh, reduce the impact and the prevalence of those small hive beetles. Fabulous. Um, and, oh, and there was a follow-up question. So those uh, small hive beetles only eat the bees? They don't have any other possible? They are, uh, yep, they are. They are only associated with honeybees, that, that group. Uh, um, there are other relatives around here. Uh, again, they're, they're, they're native to Africa. So uh, where bees, where many bee species are found, um, and, uh, and, but their relatives here don't do other things, the, the, the sap beetles in general, but those, that species is specific to the bees. Uh, it prefers, I think the comb and the honey and some of the food stores, but will, will kill the larvae as well. Cause the larvae are kind of fairly defenseless and they're nutritious. So things are going to eat them also. Yeah. Um, going back to the tiger bee fly. Um, we mentioned that the, the larva ate, well, fed on the, the larva of the carpenter bee. Um, what do the adults feed on? So many bee flies that have longer mouth parts will visit flowers, but uh, tiger bee flies, they don't really have long mouth parts. I'm pretty sure they don't really feed as adults because they get so much nutrition from the carpenter bee larvae. Yeah, um, sense. <laughs> yeah, those pictures that you showed us. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's possible they do take nectar sometimes, but I have never seen them on a flower. Um, I have a feeling that they don't really feed as adults, uh, but I'd have to find out for yeah. sure. All right. Um, and then we had a question from Ashley saying, is it safe to assume that if you see anything other than the bees themselves near the hives or the like the holes that the carpenter bees, um, are they doing harm? Is it is, is If something is by these homes of the animals, is it safe to assume that they are parasites or prey? <laughs> uh, there are a lot of, a lot of these wasps, you know, 
And uh, and again, it goes a lot of the solitary wasps and bees uh, have similar habits, so that they're, they're attacked by a lot of similar things. Probably, if something's investigating those holes and those nests, it's probably interested in some part of the bees' lifestyle. And even if they feed on just the food stores and stuff, they can actually be harmful to the bees. Mm-hmm. Of course, um, it's hard to say specifically though, but. Um, but for the most part, from what I know, it's uh, unlike, say, some ants where they have some things that will live in the nest kind of for for um, uh, protection, uh, you know, may not be doing so much damage to the ants. With bees, it's oftentimes it's going to be something that's kind of trying to eat either their their food or their their actual larvae of themselves. Them. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and Elise was wondering, are there bees for parasites to other bees? Yes, yeah, so those uh, those kleptoparasites, those bee, those cuckoo bees are true bees. So they are they are basically uh, develop. You know, actually, it happens repeatedly in bees where there'll be a group of free living, happy bees that do. You know, they work and, and work hard and get their pollen, and then they're out of them evolves a group that's like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that, and I'm gonna just steal other bees stuff. Uh, even within certain groups, uh, for instance. Uh, and this happens again also with some social wasps, but for instance, there are bumblebees that are nest parasites as well of other bumblebees. So you may, you know, unless you know what they look like, you may think, oh, this is just a regular bumblebee, but it actually, what they'll do is they'll go in and they'll take over the nests of other bumblebees uh, and kill the the host colony so that they don't have to really um, uh, find a site and find all that food. And then they begin their own colony basically. So, it does, even just a bumblebee can sometimes be a parasite. Yeah, it's a dog-eat-dog dog world. Yep. <laughs> All right, um, so we, the, our final question before we are out of time. Um, people are asking about this picture that you have up on the screen right now. Yeah. Um, was there was a, do, yeah. yeah, if you wanted to explain what was going on in this yeah, picture. Yeah, that's why I brought it back up again, because this is a really cool one. So this is the, uh, you can... I, I don't know if you can make it out, but this is actually an insect right here. Uh, again, like I said, there are a lot of ambush predators that sit on flowers, and because bees like flowers, they are often one of the prey items. This is the nymph of an ambush bug, uh, aptly named. And actually, you can see that is its rostrum, its its beak, because it's jabbed into the soft neck of the bee. And that's again, bees are fairly uh, well protected as well, so um, they usually these these sucking predators will jab them in like the in spaces in between segments. But you can see this, these also have raptorial front legs like a mantis. And what they do is they it's grabbing the leg of the bee and they have a very quick acting venom. And so they could take down, uh, this one could probably even take down a bee twice that size. Um, but these will develop into these really beautiful um, uh, flower looking uh, ambush bugs, these, these uh, type of assassin bug as well. So really cool. So you, if again, if you see a bee kind of laying motionless on a flower, there's most likely some kind of crab spider or ambush bug or some kind of uh, a camouflaged insect actually eating it that you might not recognize at first. Yeah, and we had a question in that the bottom left corner is that a is that another bee? Is that a fairy bee? Is That's that actually a, another type of wasp. So That's oh, a parasitoid wasp uh, oh, okay. of a completely different group. It does doing its own thing, but it also they also like pollen and nectar as well. So you know, flowers bring a lot of different pollinators. Um, and so that's, that's again, these, these generalist predators, it, this could have easily been a fly who was visiting the flower or a beetle or something like that, that the, that the ambush bug would grab and, and kill. So they don't care what it is, as long as they can grab it and kill it and eat it, uh, they're happy. So, um, yeah. All right. Fabulous. Oh, and uh, Marcel was wondering, did you take these photos? Yes. So I took, uh, I took other, other than the ones that had the little, the copyrights in the bottom for attributing other people, the, most of the photos were mine. Um, and I enjoy them. I do, I do, uh, um, I am sad at the fact that I don't have as many bee photos. Uh, I need to sit around flowers more and take more photos of bees. Uh, for instance, some of those cuckoo bees, I would love to have my own photos of and, and some other groups, but uh, I was really happy to get those, that velvet ant and those bees in the, in nesting in the mud. It was, it was a really cool sight. Yeah, you have some amazing pictures. Oh, yes, Marcel was saying that they, they like the, the photos a lot. So thank you so much for sharing. Oh, All right. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share my screen for our little final 
final thing. Um, but I did want to say thank you so much, Matt, for speaking with us. I learned so much about um, parasites and predators of bees and yeah, I'm still that tiger bee fly larva. That's, that was intense. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and thank you all for tuning into this talk. And we hope that you also found these predators and parasites interesting. We'd like to thank um, BISF for their sponsorship of BugFest this year. And as always, thank you so much to our museum members who help make events like uh, BugFest possible. So if you renew your or, or join um, with your membership during this event, you get that free BugFest t-shirt that's up on the, the screen right there. Um, and there are other great programs scheduled for this week. So we'll post a link to our schedule with how to register for those programs. And again, this recording will be available on our YouTube playlist um, if you wanted to check back and see all of Matt's cool photos and things like that. Um, and thank you so much for attending and we hope that you have a great rest of your day.